Good morning, everybody. Um, as our program director has said, my name is Kamendran. Um, I lead uh, our sourcing and procurement and supply chain practice for Accenture Consulting in South Africa. I'm uh, delighted to be here. First time in East London, I have to say. So uh, it is a real city. I'm going to take all of that back to Joburg. I was saying to somebody at breakfast, I was, I was amazed how full the flights were coming to East London yesterday when I flew in in the afternoon. So it's a really good, good, good sign. Um, I really like the opening address and some of the key points that, um, that our professor has laid out for us. Um, I, uh, I do think you know, we are at a, at a very interesting tipping point if we look at the world of procurement. Um, and so hopefully in the next sort of 40 minutes or so, uh, give you all a sense of where we think procurement is headed in the future and how we as procurement professionals uh, potentially are going to be impacted by this and what we should be doing as we prepare for a very, very interesting uh, future. Uh, I think the key question that I really liked uh, from, the, from the professor this morning was how do we balance quality with dwindling resources? And how do we move procurement to the center as opposed to a support function? How do we move from low levels of automation and think about this world of robotics and digital and artificial intelligence and what does that all mean for procurement and supply chain. And we'll explore some of these topics and hopefully give you some food for thought uh, that you can start implementing and at least challenging the way we do things currently uh, when you get back to your own organization. Um, so, to start, um, we're going to talk about the future and we're going to talk about the future of procurement specifically. So. To kick off, uh, I would like to make um, a couple of predictions about the, about the people in this room. And granted, I don't know much about you, but I'm going to make the assumption that you know, most of us here today make our living by doing our work in sourcing and procurement or supply chain. So you could be a, a CPO, a category manager, a buyer, or somebody managing sort of procurement operation, or a consultant in the procurement field. Um, and if this is sort of the mix of our audience, then I'd like to put forward uh, the following predictions. So prediction number one is that about 50% of you will most likely not be employed by a full, full time by a large corporate organization in the near future. So think about that, right? So 50% of you will not be employed by a large corporate organization. Now, this doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to add to some of our unemployment challenges, but you will probably be um, CEOs of your own companies, you will be entrepreneurs, you will be a more liquid workforce that works in a space and a time uh, that suits you and the kind of things you want to achieve in your life. And so, this is an important part of, of the discussion. The second piece is that the 50% of you that will be working for a large corporate organization or a large institution um, your success will hinge on how well you deal with this liquid workforce. So you are going to have to depend on this set of partners to make you successful. And how that integration works is going to be key to your own success. So the futures of these two groups are going to be really, really intertwined. So that's prediction number one. Prediction number two is that if today you work for, a, for an organization or an entity that has a chief procurement officer, there's a strong chance that for about 50% of you, that role will, will no longer exist in a couple of years' time. Rather, we believe that the chief procurement officer role will transition to something more like a chief value officer, or even something like a chief ecosystem uh, director. Okay? So why do we make this assertion? Why do we make this prediction? We have, a, we have strong evidence in a lot of the global research that we do that in the future, where networks, where partnerships, um, where all kinds of interlinking entities will start to be important, uh, procurement will play a central orchestrating role uh, in driving those partnership strategies and, and architect who does what. And if you think about the fact that procurement is one of the few organizations, one of the few entities in an organization that sits on the boundary of the internal part of the business and is the face to the market in many respects. Procurement is that entity that is best placed to play this ecosystem and uh, direct this sort of a role. So that's prediction number two. And a, 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 you know, as, as we kind of sit here at the, at the bottom end of Africa, and we think about these predictions, 
And, you know, we may be tempted to think that these things are kind of really, really far away. Um, but in my view, this is quite a dangerous assumption. And so the, the plus one prediction here is that all of this will probably happen within the next three to four years. So really, this is just a, it's a blink away, um, if, if you think about your careers. So, with, the, with these predictions as a, as a base for our starting point, uh, I want to spend the next 40 minutes or so sharing with you why we believe these predictions have a strong chance of becoming reality, and why as procurement professionals, we really need to be prepared for this next evolution of, of procurement. So let's uh, reflect here a little bit and think about our history uh, as a procurement uh, organization, or as a procurement capability. What you'll see is that from the 1990s up to about 2005, um, you know, procurement really did thrive as a capability, right? We saw maturity, we saw excellence, we saw key processes and capabilities, you know, reach really good levels of understanding. And so these were things like structured contract management, methodologies around strategic sourcing, um, focus on category management, requisition to pay became more formalized, supplier relationship management, procurement strategy. All of these capabilities really did grow and really became something that was considered to be you know, important and strategic within, within the organization. And then 2007, 2008, uh, globally we had, we had the global recession and the global financial crisis. So what happened then? We saw most organizations across the world turn to their procurement organizations to help them drive cost savings to effectively survive and manage through this very difficult uh, global crisis. And so at the same time, you know, we saw technology certainly became richer in functionality, you know, became something that uh, users adopted more, read more readily. But we also saw lots of legislative requirements to help manage risk in these times, right? So, so our professor spoke about the fact that when we deal with suppliers, the risk associated with appointing suppliers, how do you make sure they don't go bust? How do you, you know, think about long-term value, etc.? All of these things were quite prevalent during this era from you know, 2007 to about 2013. Lots of focus on regulation and procurement had to help drive a lot of that. And then as we move into, into the yellow blocks there, 2014 to 2016, 2017, procurement faced another disruptor and that disruptor was digital. And so we've seen over the last three years, um, you know, the digitization of everything, right? So we've seen processes become more digitized, we've seen interactions with suppliers become more digitized, our interaction with customers and end users taking more of a digital flavor, you know, lots of rapid maturing uh, platform technologies. So sensor technology was the other bit that actually grew quite a bit during this phase. So these are some of the things that have impacted procurement over, I would say, the last three years. So, you know, you may be sitting here looking at this picture and um, saying that, you know, within the academic institution context, within the PERCO context, you know, where are we on this spectrum? Um, and, you know, you may still say that you're in this mode of perhaps cost savings is still what we need to focus on. Uh, but I would argue that all companies in South Africa really need to look at cost reduction differently, right? Procurement has become more and more, as we take center stage, it's not about cost reduction necessarily, it's about value creation to the organization. And that value creation is not just, you know, the bottom line impact, but also top line growth. So, research shows, you know, that, that there's obviously limits to which you can push, push suppliers on price, for example. After that, you need to think about different ways of working for the relationships to be sustainable and for the relationships to drive value, value both ways. Um, okay, so as we stand here now and we, we look over the edge into 2017 and beyond, what is it that we see procurement organizations thinking about? To, to answer that question, we, we go back to some, some good old-fashioned uh, research. Accenture globally conducts a study uh, called uh, Procurement Mastery, and we've done this now probably for the last uh, 10 years or so. And what it is, is a, is a survey of global supply chain and procurement leaders uh, at a global level, where we really try to understand what is it that's pushing the boundaries of procurement? What are leading organizations looking at to enhance the quality of what they do and the service they deliver to the business? Um, and you know, in that, uh, we released the study, the latest one in January 2017. And 
the study revealed two really, really important things. The first is that procurement masters, the leading organizations, um, have continued to focus on what we've called the traditional capabilities within procurement. So if you look at the slide, um, the, the gray colored uh, items there on, on, on your right, things like procurement strategy, good category management, how we manage suppliers, sourcing, contract management, RTP, procurement <coughs> workforce, all of these things we've done for decades now as procurement. Procurement masters continue to excel at working really well within these capabilities. But the survey clearly showed that these masters are also investing in people, money, capacity, etc., to build a new set of capabilities that they think will be successful, for, will be important for them to take them into the future. And these capabilities are shown uh, in blue. So ecosystem management is around um, the partner network that procurement has to work with. So it's not just about the end user and the supplier that procurement have to work with now. Uh, if you think about startup organizations, you know, if you think about um, people who build discrete software solutions, if you think about other academic institutions, if you think about industry forums, all of these are partners in your ecosystem that you need to, to look to manage. And it gives you agility, right? So you plug into and out of these capabilities when you need it, because the future is really quite unpredictable and you need that level of agility, and a good ecosystem gives you that. The second key capability in the new is a much closer link between procurement and the business around demand management. So it's not about just getting a request from the business around, I need X number of widgets delivered at this day to, to help me do this. But it's actually questioning, is that really the, the demand that you need? Is there a way to optimize that demand? Can we consolidate demand? Is there a new technology we can investigate to reduce demand? And we see procurement leaders asking more and more of those questions. Uh, as they think about this piece. Insight management um, is really about how we use analytics more aggressively within the procurement function, right? So uh, Octavius used the example of the spreadsheet. Um, and in the future, you know, you're going to have so much data from so many different data sources that kind of doesn't seem to make sense. But you're going to need analytics capabilities to really interpret and synthesize uh, what, is, what is the data actually telling you and how can we drive insights and actions from that data. Uh, risk and regulation we've spoken about. I, I think, again, um, you know, there are certainly today software tools that you can use, um, to, to, to the point of, of our professor earlier, They can actually help you run these assessments on suppliers and say these suppliers are connected to politically exposed individuals and these individuals are linked into these networks and therefore it's a risk if you, if you engage these guys. Right? So some of these tools are out there and I think we just need to start looking at them more, more aggressively as procurement. Uh, finance and control, so for me, I mean the worlds of finance and procurement are kind of blending into each other now, right? If, if we as procurement are not integrated into our finance organization, I mean that's a massive issue. So the procurement masters work really hard at understanding this. I think, you know, the, the typical thing that we see in working with clients is procurement will claim I've saved, you know, uh, 100 million rand in these categories of spend, and um, the CEO then looks at the number and says, but I don't see it on my bottom line, right? And that's because the way finance takes out money, it takes out these things from budgets, redistribute budgets, all depend on how we work with procurement to do that. So there's a lot of focus on that. And then lastly, digital. Uh, and we see a lot of focus on masters on really having somebody or a team thinking about new technologies, digital technologies that can help them operate better, smarter, faster uh, in, in the new world. So, these are, the, these are the, this is quite an important concept around the traditional capabilities and the new capabilities that we see the masters focus on. Uh, and the second big point about the study was that procurement masters do all of these things really well. Okay, so there's no silver bullet here that says, you know, four out of this, out of this list uh, is the magic formula for success within procurement. You have to effectively, what the study showed is that the masters focus on all of them to make sure that they have a good level of competence across all of these dimensions. So what's the, what's the benefit of doing this? Um, we also measure procurement return on investment as part of the Accenture Mastery Study. So when we did this study in um, 2007, I think it was, we found that procurement organizations in 2007, if you take the cost of procurement, uh, so, it's, so take the team running your procurement in, in, in the organization, you multiply that by seven, that's the value that that organization, procurement organization, puts on the table for the business. So the cost of the procurement function multiplied by seven gives you the value 
That value is generated every single year. Okay? Uh, so that's the annual value that that team puts on, onto the table. Now, that was in 2007. When we did the study in 2014, that number jumped to 10. So 10 times return on investment. And when the 2017 results came out, uh, that number jumped to 15. Right, so think about that. Cost of your procurement organization multiplied by 15 is the value annually that you should be putting on the table for your business. And that value is not just cost. That value is growth, it's all kinds of other interesting things. But this is how procurement is starting to get measured at a, at a mastery level. And I think something we need to, we need to start embracing. So uh, I just want to touch a little bit on, on some of what the, what the professor said. So if it's, if it's above just traditional cost savings, uh, and you think about procurement in a university context, you know, how, how are we measuring procurement? Can we find a link, for example, that says, how is procurement helping to address the number of students that enroll at a university? You know, why can't we stretch ourselves to think about those types of metrics, which I think will have a lot more organizational relevance than simply just a, a cost savings metric? And I think we should really be stretching ourselves to think in that, uh, in that sense. But this, uh, this transition to mastery is not easy. Okay? It is, um, it, is, it, is, it is full with all kinds of interesting things, especially if you look at the, the amount of digital stuff that's, that's out there. Right? So we see this plethora of things that are, that are really trying, starting to complicate how we look at procurement and, and procurement excellence. Uh, and the procurement masters have really found a way to navigate this whole suite of digital tools and assets that are coming at them. So the reality is you know, you've got all kinds of things like um, you know, IoT, Platform technologies, gamification, blockchain, security, um, digital trust, drones, all of these things are impacting our world as procurement. And so the question then is, how do we start to think about a, a framework that can help us in a more simple way figure out how we approach and look at procurement in the future? And so I want to talk to you about that framework now. Uh, we, see, we see procurement in the future. Um, hinging on two, two specific concepts. One concept is the virtually integrated <coughs> enterprise, or virtually integrated teams, right? So, in the future we believe that procurement will become a more central core team. That team will certainly be smaller than most of what we see today, and it will certainly be more specialized, right? And, and why will it be that? It will be that because we'll have other technologies and automation taking away a lot of the noise and giving you know, people the opportunity to focus more on the value-adding procurement activities, like defining supply-demand policies, like working out risk and regulation strategies, like thinking through commodities, etc. Um, so a smaller central procurement team is a, is a core part of this virtually integrated enterprise. We then see that team supported by three groups of, uh, of uh, interfacing entities. One of that, obviously, are business stakeholders, so that will remain as it does today. The second piece is around embedded procurement teams. So we certainly see many organizations shifting a lot of their procurement capacity and skills back into the business. So people in procurement become more integral to end users. They sit with end users at the, at the core face of operations to really understand how are the commodities being managed, what are the different value creation opportunities we can work on, and you know, how do we then translate that back into, into value for the business. So embedded procurement teams, I think, is an important concept. And the last one, which I've talked about a lot, is this ecosystem of partners, right? So your central procurement team work with ecosystems of partners, these embedded procurement organizations, and then, and then these business stakeholders. Um, the next part of this framework says we have, a, we have a set of four key technologies that we believe will be overlaid on top of this virtually integrated enterprise. And these four technologies are cloud, IoT, or the Internet of Things, analytics, and then cognitive systems, or artificial intelligence. So if we think about cloud, um, you know, cloud technologies really allow us to move to cheaper, more efficient, more standardized uh, processing systems. So you, can, you, you don't need big, heavy, expensive ERP IT solutions. You can move a lot of your uh, IT solutions into the cloud. And what this does give you is an ability to be more agile. As your business changes, you can change your technology solutions. But you can also do really interesting things, like start to leverage social media. And so you have platforms now that can take social media listening data and move that into this platform. So you can actually start to incorporate uh, social media into your decision making in different categories or different, or different spend profiles. 
Uh, second piece is around the Internet of Things. So this is about connected devices, right? More and more, we have um, we have devices that are that are smart, connected to the internet, connected to platforms, and because these devices are smart, we're starting to see these devices talk to each other, make conclusions about things, and then autonomously take action, right? And, and later on today, there's a there's a specific session on IoT, which which we'll talk through around that. But the, the bottom line is, because of IoT, we're able to do much better things in terms of improving the way we run processes. We can think about traceability of products and services in a different way, because the sensor technology is a lot cheaper now, and, and the business case for IoT makes sense. Uh, so all kinds of things that IoT is bringing to the table that we need to be conscious of. Um, analytics, I think, is, is quite clear, and I've spoken a bit about that, so I'm not gonna, not gonna touch there, really. And then lastly, cognitive systems or artificial intelligence, right? So this is around, um, again, the ability of humans to, to do more human things and for us to move the non-human stuff into, you know, um, clever virtual assistants like IBM's Watson or Alexa. Uh, when you speak to Siri on your phone, I mean, that's a way that you are basically, you know, moving some of your admin activities to a, to a smart device. And so more and more of that technology, I think, is going to start to impact procurement, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is uh, the framework, and, and I'd encourage you to think about this, um, because you know, it's, a, it's quite a powerful way, I find, with, with our clients to talk about the procurement in the future. So virtually integrated enterprise overlaid with four key technologies, I think, is a, is a really important concept. Uh, but practically speaking, what, what could this mean for procurement in the future? Now, this is, a, this is a busy slide for the, for the analyticals amongst us, but I'm going to try and explain this. At the top, we've got, I would say, the key capabilities that procurement runs today. Um, and so we've got things like ecosystem management, demand management, category management, all the way down to um, contract management and requisition to pay. So that's the stuff we all do today. Um, we find that if we look at this area of robotics process automation, the research shows us, uh, and, and client experience tells us, that about 30 to 40 percent of what we do today has the potential to be automated in the procurement world. And uh, if you look at these orange blocks, that's really the areas where we see a lot of automation potential um, to assist in the, in the procurement organization. So, um, you know, RPA is not a new concept. Our finance colleagues, our HR colleagues, our IT colleagues have all been looking at automating processes with the, with the, you know, in different ways, and it's no different for procurement. So, I think the, the more classic ways of applying automation are really towards the, the right-hand side of the screen. So, if you look at requisition to pay, for example, you know, managing purchase orders, managing payments, a lot of that stuff is repetitive, right, and, and can be automated in a clever way. Uh, contract administration is the other area where we don't want people spending ages and ages manually sifting through documents and contracts when there's cleverer ways to do that. Um, and then the other piece, and, and the professor alluded to it, is reporting. Right Across all of these dimensions, um, there's a much cleverer way for us to think about automating reporting, revealing the truth because it's, it's pure data, it's not being interfered with, it's system-generated reports. And these reports uh, we can automate in a much cleverer and intelligent way. Okay, so the key message on this slide is automation, robotics process automation, is really going to start to impact the processes we run today. And, as, and for us to do this, we need to try and extract what we do today, all the stuff that's mechanistic, all the stuff that's repetitive, and build that into smart, intelligent software tools that can run it for us, giving us capacity to do more value-adding uh, more value adding work. The second piece that I want to talk to is about virtual colleagues or virtual assistants, and this is sort of shown in the maroon, maroon blocks uh, on the slide. So virtual assistants are be going to become more important as we think about, I would say, a lot of the, a lot of the help desk type functionality, right? So we have a, a buyer help desk, if we have a supplier help desk, if we have a payments help desk, these are the areas where we see more and more companies employing smart technologies to address supplier questions on these topics. So certainly the, um, the, the Alexas and those types of solutions will get more prominence uh, in these specific help desk type functionalities within procurement. Okay, and then lastly, artificial intelligence. Now, 
the, um, the, this is a little bit more difficult to see, but the blocks that are outlined in red are the areas where we believe artificial intelligence will start to play more and more of a role uh, within, within procurement. And you'll see that it touches on many, many areas within procurement. Right? Almost all of it, we think, will have some component of artificial intelligence built into it, uh, into, into the future. So let's, let me share an example here. There's a, there's a chemicals company um, that we, we are working with in, in Italy. And um, what this company is doing is building a solution that monitors news feeds um, across the world, right? So, so there's, a, there's an intelligent tool that looks at all the breaking news stories that are happening across the world. And that software tool also looks at all the contracts this organization is going to play. So supply contracts of all kinds of raw materials or, or specialty chemicals, etc. And this AI solution tries to match is something that's happening in the news today going to impact us because we have a contract for that commodity that might be impacted? So, you know, you think about um, Toyota manufacturing and needing parts from a certain part of the world and there's a tornado or a, or a, or a, or a tsunami that hits, right? That kind of stuff impacts you. And so this solution is then able to flag risks to procurement for them to investigate and assess whether this is a real risk or not. And that's really where I think a lot of the, uh, the world of procurement is going to go. So, in summary, take a look at this. Um, I think it's quite, again, a, a powerful picture about how our worlds are going to be potentially impacted by process automation, by artificial intelligence, um, and about virtual assistance. Um, so, so, so keep that in mind. And then is this real? Right? Is, this, is this kind of real today? And I, I want to share a few interesting, interesting examples with you. This could be your, your new receptionist. I know we spoke about outsourcing and the other things up front, so maybe not, but, but, uh, but it's a consideration. This is a, this is a technology, this is a robot, his name is Pepper, for those of you who don't know him, um, and he's been used by companies now to act as your receptionist. So you walk up to the reception desk, you're greeted by Pepper, he asks you for your name, you tell him who you're going to meet, he'll type it in onto the computer, he'll call the host, he'll then walk with you to your office where you're going to have the meeting. He'll wait for the guy to come and meet you, and then as he walks out, back to reception, he acts as a bit of a security guard, right? So you make sure that you know, things look safe and nobody's doing anything that they shouldn't be doing. And then he gets back to, back to reception. Um, and so this is, this is real. This is what you know, many organizations are actually doing today. So um, you know, the, 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 the point around the story as well is that the categories of spend that we are managing are going to be disrupted. So if you think about your suppliers, that today provide, provide you with facilities management services. They provide you with electricity consumption monitoring. They provide you with all kinds of other things. They themselves are looking at new technologies to improve the way that they deliver service. And I think as procurement, we need to be educated about these things so that we can take advantage of this category disruption that is, uh, that is coming to us. Uh, some other real-world examples. I'm not going to go through, through all of this, but uh, I think we've seen you know, smartwatches evolve now and more and more sort of industrial smartwatches. Uh, 3D printing I think is also going to be a phenomenal change. Why would you invest in a spare part supply chain when you can print the stuff on site you know, for, for some applications? Drones I think have been talked about for a long, long time. Uh, and I think the dream of having uh, your, uh, your, your latest book delivered to you by drone at your front yard is, uh, is not that far away. Uh, and then the digital double. Uh, how many of you have seen this digital double? Anybody? So the digital double is basically, it's a high resolution screen, it's an iPad, effectively, that's monitored on this, on this robotic base. Um, and what this does is that robotic base is able to, to roam and move around anywhere. So I'll, I'll, share, I'll share a personal story. I, I was fortunate enough to go to, uh, to MIT Sloan in Boston earlier this year to attend lectures for two weeks. And while I was there, I saw this digital double kind of walk up to me in one of the, one of the outside passages, uh, going, going towards the lecture hall. So I get there, and the guy waves to me, and I wave back, and we start having this conversation. And I find out that he's actually a lecturer in London that's monitoring how, <clears throat> monitoring how the lessons in Boston are going, and he's kind of just drifting into each lecture theatre, understanding how lecturing is being done. So it's not that far away, and think about it, I mean, the guy didn't have to fly over, no other costs, he can do it from the, from the privacy of his own home, you know, and this is really the kind of technology that is real and, and being used today. And so all of this for Africa, 
uh, you know, what, is it, what does it mean? Right? I certainly see a shift in the, in the kinds of conversations we are having with our clients about the future of procurement. This is not, Africa is not immune from this. Um, you know, we certainly have lots of opportunity to, to move into the space. Uh, and, I, and I do think that our secret and our trick to this is around embracing the digital world, right? With all of the digital stuff that we've spoken about today, with the technologies that exist, digital allows us to leapfrog a lot of the legacy stuff that, um, that we potentially would face and really do uh, move into the future. And so what can we do? Um, and I want to maybe end with uh, a couple of these, couple of these points that uh, for me would be, would be a good summary for you to consider. I offer you here five things to think about, arguably from, from, the, from the least complex to the most complex. Um, and you know, there's no, there's no magic formula to this, right? I think take out what you need and see what would apply to, to your specific environment. Um, but I would say that the starting point for this is really to rethink your category strategies and to really think about category disruption in the way that we've described. So all the stuff that we are procuring, I think it's part of our responsibility to say, do we really need this? Are there better ways in which this service can be delivered to end users? Why is this being done? Um, and not just accept a lot of the requests that we get as procurement for, for different things. Obviously, as, as part of our category strategies, we need to be very serious about supply development, local sourcing, uh, in line with a lot of the, lot of the imperatives, but also you know, we need to empower our people. So pulling that into a category strategy up front is really, 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 really important. Um, the ecosystem mindset, I think, is something, again, that all of us have to internalize a little bit more. It's not just about end users and suppliers anymore. Uh, it is about sort of left field organizations that can help us start up social networks, other IT partners that I think we should be looking at. Uh, the third point is around what we've called the Amazonization of procurement, right? So it's a bit of a, bit of a tongue twister. But if you've ever bought anything on Amazon, you know how easy it is, right? It feels so easy, it's so intuitive. Um, and you know, the way recommendations come up, they kind of start to know you quite quickly. So I think if we can find a way to make the buying experience simpler for the people that we work with, I think technology will be embraced. But we really do have to think about how do we simplify a lot of that, a lot of that interaction. Um, and then embracing big data, embracing analytics, and the tsunami of data that's, that's really going to come our way. Uh, interestingly, we see people start to look at this role of a, of a chief data officer uh, as something that's quite a tangible uh, move in that direction. Right? So why not have a chief data officer? Because everybody always complains about the quality of their data and, uh, and that sort of stuff. And so many organizations are seriously looking at this as a new role to help them move into the, into the digital space. Uh, and then lastly, you know, moving to, to real-time operations, right? So again, we can't afford to be on the, on the back foot. Every, every time somebody asks us, what is, our, what is our spend in this category? And we spend three days to draw up the analysis report. I mean, all of that stuff um, really should not be happening in the future, right? So we need to move more towards predictive spend analytics, we need to get better at understanding our markets and the suppliers that we deal with, so what we've called market intelligence uh, 2.0, and then just embracing intelligent automation and artificial intelligence as we've shown on some of the slides. It's coming. We just need to figure out how and where we shape, you know, where that's placed within, within our different worlds of, uh, of procurement. Okay, so five key, uh, key takeaways for you to think about. And maybe just the last picture here is... Um, is you know we, we do really feel that this is a this is quite an important inflection time for for procurement, um, and I don't know how many of you know the Kodak story, but I'll repeat it. But uh, Kodak, for those of you who don't know, uh, actually invented the world's first digital camera in 1975, and in 2012 Kodak filed for bankruptcy. Okay, 130 years the company existed and it filed for bankruptcy. So what caused this? And many people looked at the Kodak case study and said the main thing that caused this was fear. Right? Kodak executives, when they invented the digital camera, thought that promoting this product would cannibalize sales in their film business for their traditional sales. So for 37 years, Kodak executives ignored the fact that um, you know, the world, consumers, technology was all moving into this digital space. And that's ultimately what led to, to Kodak's downfall. Uh, and, uh, and elimination from the market. So we don't want to be a Kodak as procurement, right? We do want to be relevant. We do want to be center stage. Um, 
So there's no magic formula, like I've said. Uh, it's quite an exciting time to create our own future. And for me, you know, as, uh, as you go on to this exciting journey, uh, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much.